Have you ever wondered how the design of the city affects the decisions that you make? How certain streets might invite you to linger and spend more time, while other streets and spaces nudge you along and encourage you to leave? I'm fascinated by these questions. And so when I see a family like this in Chennai, India, enjoying a lovely picnic on the street just outside of a park that I'd otherwise expect them to be in, I'm fascinated about how not only design, but of course culture and social norms are impacting their decisions to have their picnic. When you look at street scenes like this, you can see people from all walks of life, but pedestrians especially, choosing to walk in the middle of a busy road, school children as well. And when you look at the sidewalk, the design of it, or the lack of, it's easy to think to understand that this design, these investment choices, are impacting the decisions that people are making to move through their city. I think we can do better than this. But the problem is, is that when people, <clears throat> through the process of globalization and urbanization, come out of poverty, this is what they're welcomed into. The emerging middle class is encouraged to live in places that seem to not even understand that people are going to be living there. How does the design of this place affect the behavior of the people that live there and use it? In contrast to vibrant street scenes that we know from other parts of cities, like this in Delhi, where the street and the buildings create rich and diverse invitations for people to meet and interact, we consistently now, in this day and age, build places that almost restrict any, kind, any type of social interaction and opportunities to meet. So how do we address this? How do we put people more in the center of our decision-making processes about how we design our cities? For us, this begins with a, a form of architectural ethnography. It's based on going out, meeting people where they are, and observing their behavior. So this gentleman here in the brown shirt, he is engaging in a process, telling us some of his preferences, and we document them. These two gentlemen here in the white shirts are voting with their feet or with their seats about what parts of the city invite them to linger and where they like to spend time. So we take this information, we try to map it, document where people are spending time and where they're not, and then put that in conjunction with the quality of public space. So we also look at this life and find out, well, what are the, the spatial parameters? In this case, the overhang of the flyover or the rhythm of the columns. What are these parameters that are encouraging a relatively informal or organic market to grow and flourish here on the street? When you think about places and investments that are made without this understanding, it's easy to see where it goes wrong. So in, outside of Chennai, a, a new market was, was built, a multi-story market that was supposed to sort of uh, make this make this street life a little bit neater. But you see, shop owners and vendors don't like to be up uh, on the upper floors. The ground floor is where they can sell their wares and where patrons can see them. The upper floors are really only used to look out over the real heart of this market, which is located completely outside of that, uh, of that structure. So this form of architectural ethnography, understanding the needs and, and patterns of people, are incredibly flexible. It's the same approach that we used when we started working with the Bloomberg administration in New York City to understand how their streets and spaces could be improved as well. So with this approach, we were able to find some pretty startling uh, observations. First off, Times Square didn't have a square. <laughs> it's actually 90% road space. But when we looked at how that space was encouraging use, we saw that almost all the people, about 90% of all the people that were in Times Square were squeezed into this 11% uh, of the area. So something was wrong there. There was an opportunity to do something different. The Department of Transportation took some of this information and began to almost literally overnight transform places like Times Square from this to this to that, sorry. Because they knew that there was this latent capacity that would fill in the space as soon as it was created. So this approach of reclaiming underperforming streetscape was applied all the way from Central Park down to Union Square. 400,000 square feet of reclaimed space, or the equivalent of 18 Rockefeller centers, 
right in the middle of Manhattan. Places that used to look like this now not only provide public space, but most importantly, provide also smoother move, moving traffic. Cars can move also better through Midtown now because of these improvements. So this type of win-win-win situation is at the heart of People First Design. It's about not just a single person's vision, but an opportunity to create a canvas, essentially. A canvas where the local creativity, entrepreneurship, ingenuity can express itself and evolve over time based on the individual needs and collective urban culture that's changing quite rapidly in cities. So when we began to work with the Inter-American Development Bank in Mar del Plata, Argentina, we used some of these same approaches. We started out by studying people's behavior and needs, documenting it, understanding if there are parts of the city where there was a, uh, an undemocratic distribution of space, where there could be more opportunities for space to be given to people. Again, using inspiration from New York, a series of temporary pilot projects were installed. 40% more space for people was created. And from early on, a whole lot of different types of groups of people began to take that invitation. Young and old, rich and poor, met together out in the middle of the street. 12 parking spaces became 116 spaces for people. It seemed to all be going really well. About three months in to this project, the mayor calls us up, panicking. Social media had began to express the views of some people that were suspicious about why the government was doing this. What was the real intention of making these changes? Who was benefiting and who was losing out? People were even critiquing some ticky-tack details about the furniture not being high enough quality or of Mar de Plata style. So he wanted to take him out. He asked us, you know, what are we going to do? We need to get rid of this program. I said, actually, this is perfect. This is exactly what we should be doing. You've created now and inspired thoughtful, caring citizens that have an opinion about what their streets and spaces should be. And now, through this pilot test project, you have a platform to get their input about how to improve it. So we went back out, utilized some of these same methods, really found out with facts how some of the anecdotal evidence being spread on social media could really, how was it really performing? So we found there were more pedestrians, more people spending time, and we took this data out to people, showed and expressed it to them, and then listened to what they had to say. Because now we had a shared vocabulary. We had something that we can touch and taste and feel and experience, and a, a platform to get really meaningful dialogue and input from citizens that otherwise maybe wouldn't have a voice or wouldn't be visible. So using this combination of data and input out on the street, the citizens helped the mayor's office devise a new plan, a plan that kept a lot of the same um, design but included some changes. We then took that revised plan out to the, to the stakeholders of the street, the business owners, landowners, and merchants, and asked them if you support these changes and if you'd also invest in them yourself. The vote was a 90% majority in favor. So now these people that were once against the project felt like they had a way to make it their own. So does design of cities and spaces impact our behavior? Absolutely. It can either help it flourish and emerge in places like New York and Mar del Plata, or it can almost prohibit it, like in the market in Chennai. But more interesting, I think, is the idea that this process, this feedback loop of measuring how people are using space and using it to create temporary projects that can then be refined and revised, a, a feedback loop of meaningful and productive dialogue between citizen and decision maker has vast implications, can help improve governance, help engender trust between citizens and decision makers, and have uh, a big impact beyond just the everyday routine. So people first design seems like it might not be totally capable alone, of course, of tackling something as complex and difficult as poverty. But more than individual projects or process, I hope what this describes is a change of mindset, a change of mindset in which we put people in the center of our decision-making processes, whether that has to do with city design, economic policy, or health. In doing so, I hope that we're creating an opportunity for people to be agents of change, unleashing their potential, 
to not only put, come out of poverty, but also hopefully have a wonderful place to live after they do so. Thank you.